Matthew chapter 2 is where I'm asking you to turn once again with me. Hope you brought your Bible with you. If you have your device out, I'm assuming that, that you have the Bible open on it and you're not texting. You're not playing games, video games, but you're following along in the Word of God, okay? Plenty of time for the rest of that stuff other days and uh, other hours today. All right, Matthew chapter 2. Now, I have, I've titled this message, Hide and Seek. And I think you, you figure out why when you went through that reading with us this morning already in this second chapter of Matthew. But it also reminds me, one of the happiest memories that I have as a child is playing on summer nights. And often, when we played outside in the summer, we play all different kinds of games. One of my favorites was hide and seek. It's possible to see this chapter as a hide and seek chapter, but it certainly isn't any game at all. It's, uh, in some ways, a life and a death matter. But it begins with wise men who seek Jesus to worship him, and then Herod seeks Jesus to eliminate any contenders for his throne. And of course, this faces, uh, this forces rather Joseph to take that child and his mother and to hide from King Herod, who wants to kill him. That's why I've called this Hide and Seek, Matthew chapter 2. I want to pause a moment and pray, and then I want to look at it in several different ways. Let's begin. Our Heavenly Father, thank you so much that we can meet together with an open Bible, and we can expect to hear from you, because the Bible is the Word of God, and it is through your Word that you mainly communicate to the hearts of people. And I pray that that would uh, be exactly what happens during our minutes here today, that you would speak to us out of, out of your word, and that we would be the kind of hearers that would be responsive, and that we would want to know what it is that you have to say to us as individuals as well as a church. Lord, I pray that uh, your word would be just as it says it is powerful so that it uh, penetrates into the very depths of the human soul and uh, lays it bare and reveals to us ourselves not only our real thoughts but our real intent our real motives behind them lord we ask that as a result we would yield to you we would surrender completely to you. We would want you and your way in our life. We thank you for this chapter and for uh, the truths that are in it. Now speak and magnify Jesus through it, Holy Spirit. We pray for his glory. Amen. Amen. Obviously, in the first 12 verses where you have the wise men seeking Jesus, and of course it ends when they find him and they worship him, you could take that whole section of verses 1 to 12 and call it homage. It's worship. That's what these men are involved in. But I wanted to mention the fact that last week when we looked at chapter 1 in Matthew's Gospel, we saw that Jesus, he deserves to be reverenced by everyone. And here in chapter 2, Jesus begins to get some of that reverence that he deserves from these men that are called wise men. In fact, when you get to the very last chapter of the book of Matthew, what you discover is that he is Lord of all. That this little child, that these wise men arrive at the house where he is staying, and they fall down before him and they worship him, 
in the end of the book of Matthew, he is Lord of all. He says, all authority is given to me in heaven and in earth. He is Lord of all, and also as a result of who he is and what he came to do. And by Matthew 28, it's all complete. He has died, he has risen, and he is just about to ascend to the throne, and he says, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Go to all the nations and, and give them the good news. Make disciples of people from all over this planet. And so the gospel is not just for the Jewish people, but it is for all people. He came to save his people from their sins, i.e. the Jewish people, but as a result of that, he now saves anyone who calls upon him. The Apostle Paul would say this, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And I want to ask you this morning, whether you're watching online or whether you're here in this audience, have you called upon the name of the Lord for salvation? And if you have, do you have full assurance in your heart this morning that He is your Savior? And have you made Him Lord of all as He is pictured in this experience with the wise men? I want to talk about these wise men. I want to do some identifying here. In verse 1 of, of uh, Matthew 1, it says that these wise men were from the east. They came to Jerusalem from the east. You see that? And uh, in verse 2, they asked the question uh, uh, to uh, uh, where is he that is king of the Jews? And they say, for we saw his star in the east and we're come to worship him. This gives us a little bit of a hint as to who these wise men were. But I also wanted you to note, to, to note that uh, as a result of them being here, as a result of them showing up, it says in verse 3, that when Herod the king heard these things, what? There's another king? I thought I was the king. It says he was troubled. He was really agitated. And then it says, and all Jerusalem was too. All Jerusalem, the whole city was troubled by the words of these wise men. Their unexpected foreign visitors or travelers that, that, that uh, they stir up a lot of interest in the city of Jerusalem. The word in our English version, wise men, is actually the word magoi, Greek word magoi in the uh, original language of this book. And it makes it very clear that these men were not Jewish. These men were Gentiles. They were Gentiles and uh, they were coming uh, from a far distance from the east. And uh, the fact that they are called wise men or magoi or English uh, magi is that these men were they were leading figures in the religious court life of the country that they came from and they used the science of astronomy and mixed that with the mystic uh, astrology in order to try to understand both present and future events I should stop here and just say no Christian should ever dabble in horoscopes and give any credence to astrology. It really doesn't matter what your zodiac sign is that you were born under. That is connected with paganism and mysticism and Christians have no right dabbling in that kind of stuff. These men were men from a heathen Gentile culture, pagan culture. They were scientists, but they were also mystics. And so they were given a special sign by the Lord. It's interesting to me that uh, 
the Lord speaks to people on the level that they can connect with, on the level that they can understand. And uh, this is what we see going on here. They are trying to understand this sign of this star that they see. And it reveals to them what was really, I think, a common anticipation or expectation in the world of that day that there was going to arise out of Judea a ruler. I don't know where they got that information, but that was common in the first century in the known world of that day. When it says, when they ask, where is he that is born, literally, king of Judea. That in Judea, there would arise a ruler, common knowledge in the first century. And this star that they saw indicated that this was perhaps the sign that that ruler had come. I don't know, but I do know that uh, Balaam, that uh, false prophet, I guess you could call him, in Numbers chapter 24 and verse 17, is given a prophecy from the Lord that out of Judah would arise a ruler and uh, out of Israel would come uh, a, a star that would rule over Israel. And perhaps the reference to a star in Numbers 24, 17 out of the mouth of Balaam, perhaps that word got to spread around the area. I don't know. But that's who these guys are, these wise men, in identifying them. But I want, I think also we can, to some degree, uh, locate where they're from as well. Notice it says in verse 1, they're from the east. Well, if you're in Jerusalem, anything uh, east of Jerusalem is meant to be east of the Jordan River. If you're in Jerusalem, you're west of the Jordan River. East of Jerusalem would be east of the Jordan River. And perhaps he's talking about the Jordanian and the Arabian Desert that joined together on the east side of the Jordan River. They came, I think they came from Arabia. I think these wise men, these, uh, uh, these whatever they are, these uh, men have come from Arabia because there were gold mines in Arabia. That was one of the gifts they gave. And uh, frankincense and myrrh were both heavily coveted uh, uh, perfumes and they were only found on trees growing in the southern part of Arabia. And so I think that that perhaps give us, gives us a little bit of an idea where they're from. I don't have the time to, but uh, in Isaiah chapter 60, in the first six verses, it, uh, Isaiah prophesies into the future of the coming kingdom of Messiah, uh, of Messiah that hasn't happened yet, but will happen and how that kings will come from the east and how these are uh, named in those first six verses as from Sheba which is in Arabia, Midian which is in Arabia and I can't remember the third one but anyway gives us a hint I think of where these men were located third thing about these wise men that I think is important uh, is them following the star. In verse 2, for we have seen his star in the east. Going back down to verse 9, after they have a private meeting with King Herod, it says, when they had heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And I should also say that the word east can also be translated the rising. 
So the star of the rising, what uh, they uh, in verse two, we have seen the star in its rising is what they're saying. And so when you understand that, I believe what they're saying is we first we saw the first appearance, we saw the first sighting of this star uh, from where we began. And again, isn't it interesting how God uses a star when he's dealing with astronomers, when he's dealing with men that uh, dabble also in astrology, which is the study uh, of stars in a mystic sense. God is speaking to these men through this star, and he guides them through it. And uh, uh, he's, he's moving in their lives. And when they come out of their meeting with Herod, the star all of a sudden appears again. It, it, it reappears. It appeared the first time when they were in their homeland. Here it reappears. It reappears as they come out of that meeting with Herod. And that's what made them so joyful. And it actually guides them the five miles approximately from uh, Jerusalem to Bethlehem. It's that close. It guides them, that's, and, and it stops. It must have been some type of unusual star. It's not your normal star, because it stops right over the house or the roof of uh, the house where uh, Mary and Joseph and Jesus were staying at the time. They followed it right there, uh, and they rejoiced at the stars reappearing. And it hovers over that house that Jesus is inside of. Now mind you, Jesus is none other than the Son of God. He is God in the flesh. Do you remember how God manifested His presence in the wilderness during those 40 years? What was it? A bright star-like cloud that hovered over the roof of the tabernacle, the tent where worship was carried out. I don't know but perhaps that's what we're talking about here. It's the Shekinah glory of God, that star, is not some um, astronomical uh, uh, celestial body, but perhaps it's the very glory of God that is hovering over the roof of this house where this young family is staying and indicates the fact that in this house dwells God himself and the person of Jesus. Here are Gentiles who sought for the Lord, sought for the Messiah. You think it's only Jewish people? In fact, it's Gentiles that seek for the Lord and they found the Lord. And it is so ironic that these men come seeking for the king of Judea that they have indication was born to worship him. And the very Jewish uh, religious leaders know exactly of the prophecy that would indicate and completely identify where he would be born. And they totally ignore the fact and they're indifferent. In fact, they totally miss it. You know, here's something that I hope, I hope you get. And that is, here's men that really sincerely were seeking to worship the newborn king. The king of Judea. I trust that we are a bunch of genuine seekers. Because I'll guarantee you, if you will be a genuine seeker after Jesus, he's going to reveal himself to you. He's going to be found of you. That's, in, in fact, what the Bible says. Some of you young people, you may not have a clue as to what God uh, wants from you, what God has in store for your life. You shouldn't fret about that. You shouldn't worry about that. You should simply give your life to the Lord and trust Him to guide you and to lead you in His way, in His time, to His specific will for your life. Because if you are genuinely seeking Him, He's going to make sure you don't make a mistake. You're not going to miss Him like these Jewish leaders did. Like Jerusalem missed Jesus. You're not going to miss Him. 
uh, you're going to find God always guides people that are really seeking Him and want to know His will. So don't worry about it. You just seek the Lord and it will all pan out. Trust me. I can speak and many of you also from experience. If you will seek God, you'll not miss God's will for your life. He'll direct your steps. There's a, another thing about these men, and really I think it sums up the whole uh, section here, that when they get there in verse 11, when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother. And they fell down and worshipped him. Notice the pronoun there, him. Not her. Not her and him, but him. That is Jesus. They worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. Here's another thing about these men, worshiping. I see them following, now I see them worshiping. And really, this is the climax of these travelers' road trip. Here they are, and they are in the very house where Jesus is. Now, I don't want to get off track, but I'm convinced that Jesus being a descendant of David that there were other descendants of David in that, uh, that uh, town of Bethlehem and that uh, in that village that they were staying in a relative's house. And I could uh, go uh, further into that, but I'm not going to take the time to. Maybe I'll, I'll do it uh, in December, I don't know. But the uh, fact of the matter is, those houses, the lower floor was a stable and the upper floor was the living quarters. And uh, the floor, on the upper floor, sometimes they had a, the, the floor hollowed out and the animals on the lower floor could eat out of a trough that was right there. And uh, so perhaps that gives a little bit of understanding of, of what we're talking about here. Here he is, he's in a house, they get there, and what's their immediate response when they see Jesus? They fall down. They prostrate themselves on the ground. They fall flat, prostrate, they reverence him as the Messiah King, and in doing so, they're really oblivious to themselves. And then they, they're worshiping Jesus, and they're lavishing him with expensive gifts. Gold, frankincense, and expensive gifts. You know what? That's a great picture of what worship really is. Worshiping the Lord is you forgetting about yourself. Worshiping the Lord is being oblivious to yourself. Worshiping the Lord is simply falling down, as it were, if not literally, in your heart before God. Uh, that, you, that you then lavish upon Him all that you are and all that you have. That's what it means to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto the Lord. That's your reasonable service. That's their reasonable service. That's what they're doing here. And incidentally, I'm convinced that perhaps the gifts that they lavished upon the Lord were used by Mary and Joseph to finance their, their trip to flee when they took flight from Herod and perhaps also take care of them when they were, however long they were there in the land of Egypt. All right, so homage. The second main thing I want you to see in chapter two is what I would call hostility, hostility. And it begins in verse three where Herod gets hot under the collar. When Herod the king had heard these things, what? There is a newborn king to rule one day here in Judea? He was troubled. Let me tell you, he was not happy. He was, uh, he was angry. And uh, he was so angry that uh, he gathered all the chief priests and scribes 
of the people, all the religious leaders of Israel together in a, in a private meeting. He gathered probably what was then the Sanhedrin, the ruling elders of Israel. And he, he wants a meeting with them, a private meeting. And he demands of them, verse 4 says, where this Messiah would be born. And without hesitation. They're not ignorant of the facts. They know very clearly what the Scripture says. And in verses 5 and 6, they, they quote Micah 5, 2. And then Herod in verse 7 he calls the wise men privately and and he tries to he tries to get more information from them to pry information hey uh, when exactly did you first see this star appear because he wants to get a time frame now I wonder how much time has gone by since this king was born and he he's trying to to gather information. Well, we'll get to that in a moment. But I just want to say something about Herod. Herod the Great. That was his uh, moniker. Herod the Great. And he was great in many ways. Herod was a very complex person. Very complex person. Racially, Herod was an Arab. Herod was uh, an Idumean. He was uh, in the line of Esau, Jacob's brother. Religiously, though, Herod was Jewish. He uh, had, uh, for his own uh, purposes, had uh, adopted Judaism as his religion. But culturally, Herod was a Greek. He was steeped in Hellenistic culture. And you look at uh, some of the building projects that he masterminded, and you see Greek influence upon his architecture. But also politically, Herod was a Roman. He was put in power by the Roman Empire and uh, he, he was in cahoots with them and he played up to them in order to gain that position and maintain that position that he was in. Herod was a brilliant man. I mean, you can go to Israel today and you can still see what are now ruins of some of his architectural masterpieces and it's absolutely amazing. One of the, the, uh, one of the greatest preservations of Herodian architecture is in Caesarea Maritima, Caesarea by the sea, uh, on the Mediterranean Sea uh, in the north uh, uh, west area of Israel. Amazing, brilliant man. He was obviously a genius in, in uh, some ways, but I'm telling you something else. He was not only brilliant, he was absolutely brutal. He had about 10 wives, and in, in those days, kings would marry wives for political position to, to be able to gain or maintain their power. He had about 10 wives. He killed several of them. Anyone that was a threat to his throne, it didn't matter if you were related or not. In fact, uh, I think uh, one of the emperors of Rome said it would be better to be, to be Herod's pig than his son. You'd have uh, more chance of survival, in other words. He, he strangled several of his sons whom he saw as a threat to his throne. He killed his favorite wife when he felt uh, threatened uh, by her. And so he was a very brilliant but a very brutal man as we see in this chapter. And so he begins some investigation in those verses that we read because when you are all about yourself and all about maintaining your power, maintaining your wealth, maintaining your position, you can become very paranoid. He was a man that, that uh, shows the classic uh, uh, identifying marks of paranoia and really insanity. In fact, when he heard this news, he immediately thought that this was the beginning of an invasion to dethrone him. And so he was troubled, he was angry, he was agitated. 
he gathers the Sanhedrin to pinpoint the exact location of the Messiah's birthplace. He finds it, as they said, to be Bethlehem. Incidentally, Bethlehem, house of bread, is what it means. And who is the one born there? But he who is the living bread from heaven, right? Pinpoints it as Bethlehem. And in fact, in, in Micah chapter 5 and verse 2, which uh, they quote in verse 6, the Jewish leaders quote to him in verse 6, we, we are informed in Micah's prophecy that Messiah is more than a man. That Messiah is God in human form. The Jewish scriptures say this. The Jewish scriptures say the, the Messiah that is going to come to govern Judea, the, the king of Judea, is going to be none other than the everlasting father, the, the, the one from all eternity. That's what Micah 5.2 says. Check it out, my dear Jewish friends. And then also we learn uh, basically uh, from this information that... Uh, that it's possible to know all about the Lord. It's possible to know these things about the Lord and still oppose Him, like Herod. You know, ultimately, no one can thwart the purpose and plan of God. It's going to get done. But human beings have always tried to hinder what God wants to do. Now, let's be careful not to fall into that group. Let's be careful not to be, even in a lesser way, like a Herod that would seek to hinder the very purpose of God in our own lives. Here was a chance for him really to get his life squared away, right? But that was the farthest thing from his thinking. He wanted to protect himself and his power. Don't be like a Herod. Listen to what the scripture says. Don't just know about it like these Jewish leaders did and then ignore it and miss Jesus and miss the Messiah. Don't try to deny the truth that is right there in your own scriptures. And so he becomes, Herod does, very deceptive. And he says in verse 8, when he, after meeting privately with the wise men, okay, go to Bethlehem. And, uh, and verify that the young child is there and when you have found him come back and uh, verify it to me personally that I can come and worship okay so here we see hostility in deceiving He's very, he has a secret meeting and he requests that the wise men report back to him pretending that he desires to pay homage like they did to uh, Jesus. It's just like, like many who uh, are really uninterested in an honest search for Jesus. You know, be careful about casting your pearls, the, the, the precious truth about Jesus before swine that will just trample it underfoot and not value it at all. I think in many cases it's, it's ridiculous to enter into debates with people whose minds are totally closed, who are really not honestly interested in the truth. They just want to match wits with you. They just want to prove their point. That's what we see here. And as a result of uh, something that happens, look at verse 13. It says, And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. After the wise men left, after they finished worshiping the child, the angel appeared to Joseph in a dream. Now this is the second time Joseph has had a dream in which he's gotten information from the Lord, revelation from the Lord. And here's what the angel says, Arise, take the young child and his mother, and flee into Egypt, and be there until I bring you word. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him, to kill him. Look down at verse uh, 15. 
they did depart to Egypt and were there until the death of Herod. From Bethlehem to Egypt, or to the, at least the border of Egypt, from Bethlehem to the border of Egypt is approximately 80 miles. And Egypt in the first century, interestingly, was a haven for Jewish people. In fact, Alexandria, Egypt, was the most significant cultural center of the Jewish diaspora in the first century. We are told that in the first century, approximately one million Jewish people lived in Alexandria, Egypt. Well, it's very logical that the angel of the Lord would have uh, Joseph, Jesus, and Mary fleeing there. And then I want you to note something that I think is very interesting in the 15th verse as we continue to, uh, to read on. He, it, the angel tells him to, to specifically flee into Egypt in verse 13. And then in verse 15, he says that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet saying, out of Egypt have I called my son. Now this is, this, is, uh, this can be a little uh, confusing and, uh, and mind-boggling. I think what Matthew is doing, Matthew of course inspired by the Holy Spirit, speaking to Jewish people predominantly, his gospel, is using a rabbinic method to interpret the Bible. There are several rabbinic methods that, that uh, the rabbis use to interpret the scriptures. One is what is called Peshat, which means simple. And it refers to a literal understanding of the scripture. That's what we try to practice when we open the Bible together. We pursue a historical, grammatical uh, uh, understanding of a passage of scripture. Well, in rabbinical interpretation, that's called peshat. It's literal. And the literal interpretation of this uh, phrase, out of Egypt have I called my son, which is a quote from Hosea chapter 11 and verse 1, the Peshat, or the literal interpretation of that, is touches back on the exodus of the Jewish people out of Egypt under the leadership of Moses. In Exodus chapter 4 and verse 22, Israel is called by God, my son. My son. And so the prophet Hosea says, I have called my son, meaning the nation of Israel, out of Egypt via the exodus that we have recorded. That's the Peshat. That's the literal interpretation of Hosea 11.1. 1. There's a second rabbinical method of interpreting scripture. And uh, I believe this is the method that uh, Matthew is using here. And it's called remez. And remez means hint. And what it is, is simply what truth may be implied in a passage of Scripture. That's what Matthew is doing here. He's implying truth. He's using remez, and he's implying this truth, that in the Jewish Scriptures, it not only says that uh, Israel is my son, but it also says Messiah is my son. The servant in, in Isaiah chapter 49 and the first six verses, the nation of Israel is the one that God is, is, uh, is utilizing. In verse 6, Jesus, or the, or the Messiah I should say, the Lord's servant is the one that, that he's used, but they're, they're brought together. As, remember Psalm 2-7, Thou art my son. God says, this day have I begotten thee. So it's very true also to say that not only is Israel God's firstborn son, but Jesus is God's firstborn son. 
And what happens in Isaiah is that the Jewish people are, are going to fail to be the light to the Gentiles, but the Jewish Messiah will not fail to be that light to the Gentiles, and he will pick up where the Jewish people have not fulfilled. And so what Matthew is saying here in that 15th verse is simply that Messiah is equated with the nation of Israel and so that's why he says that Jesus has returned from Egypt after Herod's, Herod's death is a fulfillment of Hosea 11.1 1. out of Egypt have I called my son because it's true to say that Israel was God's son called, of, called out of Egypt and Messiah, Jesus, was God's son called out of Egypt get it? So you have the Peshat and the Ramez, the literal and the implied truth, all right? I know that's a little uh, confusing, I'm sorry if it is, but here we get down to uh, where the rubber meets the road. Verse uh, 16, Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceeding wroth. And he sent forth and slew all the children that were at Bethlehem. Boy, I've never seen that play out in a Christmas pageant. Have you? Somehow that's, uh, that's not in it. That doesn't conjure up the warm, fuzzy feeling of Christmas, does it? But that's the reality of what's going on at the birth of Jesus. You have these two forces at work. You have God's plan going forward. You have God fulfilling the prophecy. You have God fulfilling his word. But you have Satan and, and, uh, and flesh and blood standing up and opposing what God wants to. It's always that way. And here it's so clear, isn't it? As we see this man, Herod, he, he's tricked. And that outrages him. And he has a violent outburst. And he, he goes on a killing spree. According to Ezra chapter 2, and I think it's uh, verse 21, only 123 men returned from the captivity to the village of Bethlehem. Which means that Bethlehem in Jesus' day was a very small village. And that's exactly what Micah 5 2 says. It's an insignificant village. Least among the, the, uh, the, the, the cities or the towns of Israel. Only about a thousand people would have populated Bethlehem at this time when Jesus was born there. Which means that estimating when those soldiers went in at Herod's command to kill all the male babies two years old and under, you're talking probably 10 to 30 max. 10 to 30. So not a large massacre. In fact, the, histor the historian Josephus doesn't even mention this in his writings. But I'm telling you, it happened. It, he went on this killing spree like this. And uh, Herod completely ignores the fact that what's going on in Bethlehem is God's hand completely ignores it because he is so paranoid and so concerned with himself. Do we ever ignore God's word because we're concerned more about ourselves than we are about what God says? Before we point our finger at Herod? Oh yeah, maybe we wouldn't uh, carry out the, the kind of thing that he... But you know what I'm saying. The third and final thing I want you to see in the closing verses of uh, chapter 2 is what I call humility. Humility. Because when Herod was dead, an angel of the Lord appeared a third time in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Arise, take the young child, his mother, and go into the land of Israel, for they are dead, which sought the young child's life. focus back on Jesus here. His humility. What a humble life. He's born in a very small village. And what we're going to find is that he's going to grow up. He's going to be reared in a very despised village called Nazareth. 
Nazareth was not a place that uh, Jewish people even wanted to go. It housed a Roman garrison. Now the Romans were an occupying army and the Jewish people were under their control. And anyone that was had anything to do with Romans, especially the soldiers, were thought to be compromisers and betrayers of Israel. So that's the kind of reputation that Nazareth developed because of the Roman garrison that was stationed there and housed there. The angel calls to Joseph again in a dream, tells him to go back to Israel, and it says in verse 21, Joseph arose, he took the young child, his mother, and they came into the land of Israel. He obeys, he's an obedient man to God's word. Verse 22, but when he heard that Archelaus did reign in Judea in the room of his father Herod, by the way, when Herod died, he had written out prior to that about seven wills. The last one, he divided up his kingdom among three of his sons. Archelaus was one of Herod the Great's sons, and uh, he was just as brutal and, uh, and, uh, and evil as his father. And so we read here uh, in that uh, 22nd verse that uh, he, Joseph, was afraid to go to uh, Bethlehem, notwithstanding being warned of God in the fourth dream he, he gets, he turned aside into the parts of Galilee, and he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets, he shall be called a Nazarene. So I want you to see the humility here. Not only Christ's humility, but I, I want you to see Joseph's humility. He's, he's a man that follows the leading of the Lord. You know, one of the evidences of being a humble Christian is that you are open and willing and following the leading of the Lord in your life. Not just at certain points, but over the course of your life, you follow the leading of the Lord. God's guidance, God's leading, God's will, God's word is paramount in your life. It's the most important thing in your life. You don't move without God giving you direction. You have His leading, and until you get that, you don't take a step. There's a parallel here, I think, of, of the calling of Moses in that 20th verse uh, Moses, uh, I think that Jesus, Jesus is pictured as the new Moses, you might say. And he is going to lead a spiritual exodus of the Jewish people. I think you'll understand. But uh, I, I want you to note this as well. Herod dies, and of course he's rotting. But God's guiding is guiding Joseph and his family. And I really think that God's guidance is available to anyone that is honestly looking for it. I often am reminded of what the scripture says. God says to Israel, but he says it to you. God says it to King David, but he'll say it to you also. I will teach thee and instruct thee in the way that thou shalt go, I will guide thee with mine eye. Be not as the horse and mule that has to be held in by bit and bridle. In other words, don't stubbornly resist the guidance of the Lord if you really want it. He'll guide you. In fact, he says, he says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't rely on your own wisdom. Don't rely on your own understanding. In every area of your life, Look to Him. Rely on Him. And He'll direct your paths. Is that a reality in our lives? Is that something important to us? Here's a man that in his humility, he gets God's leading. And over and over and over again, God leads him. That's how God wants to work with us. I'm not saying that God is necessarily going to lead us with uh, supernatural dreams like He gave to Joseph. It's possible. But normally... He leads his people who will take the time to open the Bible on a daily basis 
and listen to the voice of God as he speaks through his word to your heart. If you're not doing that, you have no clue whether you're following the will of the Lord or not. You have no clue. You're just going in, in automatic mode, or you're just doing what comes naturally, or you're doing what you feel like doing. That's pride. That's not humility. That's arrogance. That's the height of arrogance. The way in which humility is shown is when you are surrendered to follow the Lord's leading in your life. And notice in verse uh, 23, as a result of following God's leading, it fulfilled God's word. The prophets. Notice it's plural, not prophet, but prophets. And I think that means that there is no specific prophecy in the Jewish scriptures that tells us that the Messiah would be a Nazarene. It's a general uh, allusion to the belief that Jesus would be a despised person like a Nazarite, like a dweller in Nazareth. In fact, the scripture says that this Messiah he would be one that would be despised of men. Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 3. And Nathaniel says, can anything good come out of Nazareth? A despised city? Thus a despised Messiah. A Nazarene. But I think most likely there is a spiritual connection between the root word for Nazareth and the root word for branch. In Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 1, the Messiah is said to be a sprout out of Jesse. He is said to be a branch out of David. And the word Nazareth and the word for branch, netzer, share the same root. In fact, it would be possible to call Nazareth branch town, or village of branch. And here the Messiah in 11.1 of Isaiah called the branch. And there's other passages in Jeremiah and Zechariah, a different Hebrew word, but he's called the branch, the righteous branch. That's the fulfilling, I think, of the prophecy that he shall be called a Nazarene. How many of you remember hearing of or remember Charles Colson? Charles Colson was a Watergate participant. He worked in the Nixon White House. And in his book called Life Sentence, by the way, he got saved in prison. He went to prison. He got saved in prison, and he began prison ministries as a result. But in his book, Life Sentence, he tells of, of strolling among the ruins of the Roman Senate when he was visiting Rome. And he recalled uh, the feelings that he had, and here's how he described them, I quote, As I stood snapping photographs, my mind flashed back to the Roosevelt Room in the White House a few steps across a narrow hallway from the President's Oval Office. At 8 o'clock each morning, a dozen of us, the President's senior aides, had gathered around the antique mahogany table. Its polished surface reflected the serious, intense expressions of men who believed the destiny of mankind was in their hands. The decisions we must make today, Henry Kissinger would often say, will affect the whole future of human history. And we believed it. Just as nearly 2,000 years ago, yet here sat their once majestic forum in a dusty pile of stone and rubble. Would even this much be left of the Roosevelt Room, I wondered, in two centuries? Let alone two millennia from now? Isn't it interesting that as time passes, What's important in human thinking gets dumped on the rubbish heap of history. 
But I can guarantee you several things that are never going to change. Number one, you're going to die. If Jesus doesn't come for his people, we all are going to die. The Bible says it is appointed unto man once to die, and after that, the judgment. That's a guarantee. Another thing I can tell you will not change is that when you die, you will stand before God. Every single human being will give a personal account of him or herself to God. And if you reject God and Jesus the Messiah as your Lord in this life, when you stand before God on that day of judgment, the Bible says, regardless, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and they will do so to the glory of God. He's Lord to the glory of God the Father. I'll tell you one other thing, and that is only a personal relationship with the Lord Himself and, uh, and eternal things above really matter. If you are, you must stop fighting God and learn to bow before Him. You have to stop hiding from God and begin to really seek Him. In fact, the Bible promises that if a person, whoever you are, it was written to Israel, but you can take it personally for yourself. If you will search for the Lord with all of your heart, that is, fully committed to searching for Him, He'll make sure that He's found of you. You'll discover Him. He'll reveal Himself to you. That's a promise. You can bank on it. It'll happen if you will search for Him. You know, I remember hearing a story of some little boys that outside of a, uh, of a place in South Africa where they discovered rich diamond mines, little boys playing, with, playing marbles in the dirt, and a man stopping and seeing the sun glisten on, on the, the marbles, and he looked down closer and realized these little boys were playing marbles with diamonds. I think that really sums up of what we're doing a lot, even as believers, with spiritual truth, with, with things that have eternal value. We're playing marbles with diamonds. We're not taking seriously the Word of God. We're not taking seriously a life for God. And we're using our lives to play, with, with, uh, to play marbles with diamonds. I want you to bow your head with me as we close today. Your head bowed and your eyes closed. I wonder, are you clean? I mean in your heart, are you clean? Is your love for the Lord uncontaminated? And then secondly, are you clear? By that I mean, are you clear about God's will for why you're here? why you're alive, why you exist, your purpose in life. Are you clear about your mission? And then thirdly, are you committed? Are you willing to pay any price necessary to accomplish God's will in your life? To see God honored, to see God worshipped, to see Him glorified. What is your life? It is but a vapor that appeareth for a short time and then vanisheth away. But you can make your life count for eternity if you will care about your personal relationship with the Lord and the things of eternity that matter to Him. So Heavenly Father, as we close our time this morning, I pray that you would bring about whatever necessary response that people here or online need to make before you that their hearts might be clean
that their minds might be clear as to what your will is and that they might be committed to following you no matter what it might cost, no matter what it, where it might lead. Just pray this in Jesus' name.